is uh, six thirty two. Um, we have a quorum. This is the uh, inaugural or the initial, the first um, meeting of the Smart Growth Steering Committee, uh, which um, blossomed out of the Halley Planning Board, thanks to a uh, funding grant from Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, and um, I, with that, I will start uh, before we go any further with introductions, I am Mark Dunn, um, member of the planning board. I'm Randy Iser, member of the select board. I'm Justin Pellin, member of the Housing and Economic Development Committee. I'm Kyle Fennell, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, senior planner in land use and environment. And Deb? I'm Deborah Levinson, and I'm representing the Council on Aging. Right. And Mike? I'm, I'm Mike Sarzinski, planning board, former counselor on the Hampshire Council of Governments, which is now defunct. But you're not. Well, close. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Andrew, are, are you there? Can you hear us? Yes, uh, I'm Andrew Gnatic. Uh I'm joining from a vehicle, so I will not have a camera on for tonight. That's fine. And you are our at-large uh, Hadley, born and raised. Well, we also have... I'm not born and raised. All right. Well, Close, but not Mike born. is born and raised. You're just raised. Yeah. And Andrew's, a recent, Andrew's a recent graduate of Hampshire College. Wow. Oh. All right. Um, and Deb, I don't know if you're born and raised here, but I'm a transplant, so... Yeah, I, I grew up in Philly. Okay. Philadelphia. In Philly? In, in Philly? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I grew ever up. Go to, in... Ever go to Koch's Delicatessen at 43rd and Locust? I don't know that one. What's the name of it? Koch's Delicatessen at 43rd and just... Locust. No, is it a good one? I'll tell you, I went to grad school there. I got out of Penn in 1975, and I hadn't been in Koch's for probably 40 years and I walked in three years ago and nothing's changed. <laughs> <laughs> That's Philly. <laughs> okay. Enough All right. Shall we jump into the agenda? Having run through our welcomes. Um, and Kayla? How about Kayla? Oh, I'm well, sorry. Hi. I'm, that's, I'm Kayla. I'm the land use coordinator. So I'll be the clerk for the committee and I'll, I'll be taking some minutes today. I'm sorry, Kayla. I don't have a screen in front of me and I can't read the small, so I didn't, I missed you there. No Thank you. Thank you for your time and uh, future efforts. Oh. And hopefully, what you're expecting, uh, did you say that the CONCOM meets on the 14th? We'll be meeting next Tuesday and I'll, I'll try to get one of the board members to um, be a representative on the committee. Wow. That would be, be great. All right. Excellent. Um, uh, I can hand it over to Kyle. Uh, Kyle uh, and Kayla would be non-voting uh, members of the committee or uh, whatever the, I'm going to call them members, but anyway, so I'll let Kyle run it. Uh, Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Let me just get situated here. Hopefully you all have the agenda that was um, on the town calendar. And I think I sent it out in the email. We did. Yeah. All right. So today I'm going to offer a presentation to uh, give a little bit of an overview of the project and orient everybody to our task and why we've all been asked to uh, support this endeavor. Uh, so you all are coming together as the Smart Growth Steering Committee. Uh, this is a project uh, partnering the town of Hadley and the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. Um, for tonight's presentation, there'll be four parts. We'll do a quick overview, um, give some background data just so everybody is aware of 
kind of what's informing the project, looking at Hadley today. Uh, we'll try to get a, a cursory kind of big picture understanding of this concept of smart growth. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with a quick little investigation of uh, Mass General Law 40R, which is the smart growth zoning and housing production law. Um, um, okay, take it away. So uh, this project um, is a part of the DLTA, Direct Local Technical Assistance. Uh, it's timely as the town has conducted recent planning efforts, master plan update in 2017, a recently adopted housing production plan in 2023. Um, and the general topic of development and particularly housing coming from the planning board that inspired the planning board to apply for grant funding through the DLTA program um, to focus on planning for housing. And in that application, they identified particularly exploring um, what Mass General Law 40R would mean for the community. So the primary goal of this smart growth DLP project is to, uh, by the end of the calendar year, craft a zoning bylaw, um, draft bylaw, that follows smart growth principles to guide future development for town. So to achieve this goal, residents, yourselves included, uh, town officials uh, will join myself and others from the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to define what smart growth means in Hadley, and then work together crafting the proper regulatory tool to encourage that type of development. Uh, there will be resident engagement, so there will be times for us to um, uh, interact with other residents and get a sense of what they would like to see for the project. Project team is primarily Pioneer Valley Planning Commission staff, um, myself as project manager and lead on the project. I'm supported by Ken Comia, our deputy director of land use environment, who's for the past three plus years, I believe, supported the planning board uh, as their professional consult, uh, consultant. Uh, the steering committee, uh, you all, uh, seven residents representing various town boards and committees and at large members. You all will serve as the convener of multiple community engagement events, providing direction to PDPC staff at critical junctures and helping us understand what the town of Hadley is looking for in a smart growth bylaw. So as I mentioned, this is a DLTA funded project, which means that it concludes at the end of the calendar year. Um, so we've got a lot to cover in the next uh, seven and a half, seven plus months. Um, looking at our timeline, we're in May already, where we'll be uh, conducting some existing land use analysis and reviewing zoning bylaws. Uh, we'll touch on that a little bit today, but it'll be a pretty thorough report. In June or early summer, we're looking at our first public engagement events. Um, that format and that time, that can all be determined by you all. Um, that could look like a special meeting. It could look like a weekend meeting. It could look like um, a, a set amount of time on a standing uh, board or committee. Um, Later in the summer, after we receive that uh, first round of input and feedback from the community, that's when we'll begin drafting the Smart Growth Zoning Bylaw. That could look a few different ways. Uh, it could look like something entirely new. It could look like revisions to existing zoning bylaws. Uh, it could look like amendments and that sort. Um, it's really gonna be determined by engaging with the public and then what you the steering committee sees as the most viable option moving forward. In the late summer, early fall, August and September, we can look forward to a second public engagement event to make sure that we're bringing back what we heard that first round to the public, getting their feedback and revising as needed. 
October, November, and December, the final months of the calendar year, we'll focus on crafting that final smart growth zoning bylaw, either as a new uh, section to be added, uh, of course, going before planning board, before select board, before town meeting, uh, or just smaller amendments to existing zoning. Uh, any questions at this point about the project broadly in the timeline? I know it's kind of quick and vague, but uh, I don't know if we need to get into this level of detail, but the Housing and Economic Development Committee has been trying to plan uh, uh, what we call the public forum on housing in Hadley, uh, including topics about zoning and uh, housing affordability and, and a whole slew of things that came out of the master plan update mm -hmm. surveys. Uh, I'm wondering if these public engagement events might dovetail into that effort and if we should talk about potentially combining those agendas. Um, I think that could be very fruitful. Um, I would leave it to the committee to make a, a full determination, but mm -hmm. I think uh, particularly as we enter the summer months, engagement is tough, mm -hmm. generally speaking. So the more we can um, coordinate, collaborate with other entities in town, um, just try to maximize you know, the time that we get with the public and not ask too much of them because you know it's the summer months everybody wants to enjoy it as much as they can so yeah um i think that's a, a, a good discussion point for later for sure thank you Justin. any other general questions about the project at this point if i was someone watching this sure. having no no background <clears throat> into we talked about smart growth smart growth uh, would they be fair to assume smart growth? Is that something that is coming out of uh, Boston language? And is that um, is that synonymous with affordable housing, uh, uh, senior housing, things like that? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I will get into it uh, a little later in the presentation. In the presentation, okay. Um, but the quick answer is it's much bigger concept than anything that the Commonwealth of Massachusetts can define. So okay. um, they use the term and I'll talk to how they use it. Okay. Uh, but it's a much bigger kind of concept and uh, toolkit of different zoning and planning strategy. Okay. Um, let's who, who came up with the name Smart Growth? Which agency in Boston? No, it's it's a the term itself comes from the planning profession. Uh, I can't tell you directly where it originated, but it's it's kind of so it's industry wide. Yeah, yeah, it's much bigger than just forty uh, R Boston, Boston, Boston. Like new urbanism and yeah, all those other yeah. yeah. Um, but let's get back to ground on Hadley today. Mm -hmm. uh, so a few slides just to get us all up to speed. I know. I Excuse me, I, I just wanted to follow up. Um, sure. I just wanted to quick follow up on that last question, which yeah. is, um, it, is the focus of this committee, my understanding was the focus of this committee was on the affordable housing piece. Is is that the case? One of them. So that's, that is one of the elements, Deborah. Th thank you for clarifying. Um, because the project is written in a way to explore 40R, 40R is smart growth zoning and housing production. So ha housing and a, a specifically affordable housing is a critical part of that, but it's not just affordable housing. It's uh, infill development. It's putting... Um, housing where infrastructure exists. It's bringing people closer to transportation. It's a lot of different things with housing, kind of this driving development pattern or force. Does that help? Uh, sure, yes, thank you. All right, uh, I'll get to some slides. And More to follow, it sounds like. We'll get there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so just so everybody, we're all on the same page, right? So you all have been working on many of these projects over the last few years. I've recognized many names. Um, so some of this will be, um, you know, familiar. Um, but 
uh, Hadley regularly amends the zoning bylaw, uh, keeping that up to date, uh, conducts recent planning projects like the master plan update in 2017, the housing production in 2023, uh, to not only encourage development, uh, but to do so in a way that fits the rural agrarian kind of traditional farm land character that community values so much. With larger communities to the east and the west, though, and a statewide or national ha housing crisis, you know, there's a lot of pressure to develop. Um, and so that brings us to our zoning and how we um, currently use the land or will in the future. Uh, the town has six base zones uh, and seven various overlay zones. Um, you know that um, within those primarily when it comes to housing, you're going to find one family detached dwellings, which are permitted across all zones. Uh, you can build a uh, one family home anywhere in the, um, except for in the industrial zone, excuse me. Um, to convert a one-family detached dwelling into a two-family, you got to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Can can we clarify that, too, for the people out there? Sure. Because that's not for any existing house. Right. It's a house built prior to 1961, which is when zoning was right. brought into yeah. town. So, so we don't want to get anybody all excited out there. That right. It's... Uh, it, it is before the uh, zoning um, was originally adopted by town in 61. 61. Right. So um, it does, that does relate to quite a bit of the housing stock, but thank you for clarifying, Randy. Yes, that's of the properties that um, were pre existing before zoning. And that's applying to the conversion. To, right. Yes, yeah, family conversion. Yeah. Uh, trailers or mo mobile homes, manufactured housing, um, very limited. Um, in town, senior housing conversion uh, is permissible uh, with a special permit from the planning board. New senior housing uh, is permitted, I think, only in the senior housing overlay district. Yes. I believe that's correct. Um, I could be mistaken. I'm, no, I think that's that is I think that's the idea because if it's intended in just increased perfect. density, right? That's the zone. That's right. the overlay. Right. Is that the footnote asterisk? That? Uh, that was the that was the asterisk that I forgot to add in my footnote. Yeah, uh, and then accessory apartments um, are uh, allowed by special permit by the planning board. Um, those would be like your uh, in law apartment type uh, residences. So that's this, this, you may recall that the uh, planning board had an amendment to the senior housing overlay district bylaw, and we wanted it to be extended to Middle Street because there was a piece of property for sale which was proposed for senior housing, and it was turned down by town meeting. Thank you for that context, Mike. So, um, in terms of mixing the uses. Uh, which is a part is a quality of smart growth, um, kind of stepping away from the old zoning model of zones of single use or mostly single use, uh, trying to bring amenities and um, options for business, commerce, or recreation closer to residents. Um, currently in the town, it's only allowed in the village center overlay district. Uh, added to the zoning bylaw in 20, 2001. Um, this is really the only kind of smart growth language that you find in the zoning bylaw. Um, it, in, it intends to encourage a mix of commercial and civic uses amongst residents, uh, providing an activity center of the town, um, facilitates more efficient public services and infrastructure. Uh, all while sustaining um, this distinctive character and community identity. Um, I mean, I think anyone who drives down Route 9 recognizes there's a very different quality 
on the west side of town versus the east side. It, it's I think that's largely in part to this zoning bylaw. Um, there are restrictions though. <clears throat> Just a couple of examples. Uh, about half of the bylaw itself re relates to the design standards. Uh, so very particular in how development looks. Uh, and that includes pitching all roof lines and they have to be, you know, any continuous section has to be less than 75 feet. So just trying to encourage that New England village um, building style. Uh, and then new businesses or new business structures uh, cannot exceed 12,500 square feet. So, you know, keeping um, the footprint of buildings, particularly in commercial buildings, a certain size. Do we, uh, do we have any data about how many developments have been built under this zoning overlay with these requirements? That's a great question. I do not have that data on hand, but I would love to find that. Not, not many. Well, well, it's, it's no. twice as bad, like none. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, no, it's not none, Mike. Um, I think the stuff down at the village barn uh, the new stuff that was done down there was under that bylaw, and that Paul Benjamin? No, uh, no, Parmar, the, oh, the okay. motel and the uh, oh. banquet facility that they built. Gotcha. Yeah, I ask only because uh, in jurisdictions around the country that I've worked, uh, this is getting close to form-based zoning, right. and what I've seen is in those communities when form-based zoning is is uh, initiated in the zoning bylaws. It usually drives away developers because there are too many hoops to jump mm -hmm. through. So I'm just curious if this, you know, from a smart growth perspective, is, is this like a, they, if you build it, they will come? It sounds like probably not. And maybe we need to evaluate what didn't work about mm -hmm. that implementation as part of this new overlay. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. Um, design standards are um, a significant portion of 40R, Master Law 40R. Uh, so it's something to consider if um, if that is a route that starts to look appealing to the community. Uh, design standards are a significant part of the work that we'll be, need to accomplish. Um, I'm going to jump into that next part. Nope, nope. We still got some data to update. Okay, uh, the master plan from 2017. Uh, I pulled out strictly the housing uh, issues and goals. Um, there were plenty that we could also look at related to economic development, transportation, those other components of uh, what we call smart growth. Uh, but in the master plan, um, three issues were related to housing um, identified. In that document, uh, maintaining a housing stock, the market and a low tax rate for homeowners, uh, reducing the rate of foreclosures or vacant housing um, or just housing stock deterioration, and then providing more senior housing uh, and housing that working people can afford. Um, uh, I do want to just point out that term working people, uh, just keep that in mind. We're going to talk about affordability in a second and just think about what is affordable nowadays. Uh, and that's lowercase a, that's just, you know, can, can this, you know, the, the young professional, the the middle school teacher afford to as opposed uh, to the state to find capital a. yeah uh, as opposed to a capital a for them um so the master plan included some goals related to housing as well uh, some of those i believe have been accomplished so congratulations uh discussing expanding the types of housing permitted in hadley so just like we we saw single family housing is pretty much the standard in town um there are different types of housing that could be uh, considered um, and would um, have to be considered uh, for a 40R smart growth, but just something to think about. Uh, consider amending the zoning bylaw to make clustered residential zoning by right and require a special permit for standard subdivisions. Uh, when we talk about clustered residential zoning, you're getting closer to that smart growth model and approach mm -hmm. of just really bringing the buildings as close to po as possible um, and really limiting the disturbance of development right it's it's not just a matter of 
putting housing where the infrastructure is already, it's also an approach of leaving what is untouched alone. Uh, so that's another way to think about it. It's, it's, it's also kind of a, an equal part development and preservation conservation approach. And fill and conversion of existing? Absolutely. Uh, a term that you may find used a lot is adaptive reuse. Yep. So it's, it's looking at what is built, how can that be reused, how do you adapt that property and that, um, that infrastructure to serve uh, multiple uses. Uh, additional goals related to housing, maintaining the 10% of housing stock as affordable, um, which we will talk about a little bit. Uh, and then also discuss creating an affordable housing trust fund, which has been accomplished. Congratulations. Um, that entity um, is partly facilitated by the planning board. Um, and is the housing committee attached at all? Um, no, we talk about it, but not, okay. not in an official capacity. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the most recent uh, planning effort uh, related to housing was the housing production plan from 2023. Just some quick data points. I uh, don't want to get too bogged down, get long-winded. Um, uh, current data says there are 2,305 total housing units uh, occupied at a rate of 97.87% or 2,256. That's incredible. That's a, a great occupancy rate. Uh, unfortunately, many of those units are aging. Um, only 30% have been built since 1979. Uh, so in the last 43, 44 years. Um, and so the percentage of housing stock built before 1940 is 26.8. Um, and that percentage, that group particularly, um, needs a lot of maintenance, a lot of rehabilitation, and that costs a lot of money. Um, so it's it's not always appealing to uh, property owners or developers to take on those properties. Um, regarding the affordable housing inventory, uh, 275 units are on the subsidized housing inventory list, uh, which amounts to 11.9% of the total year-round housing stock. So that means that you're meeting that 10% benchmark set by the Commonwealth. Uh, but of course, keeping in mind that any additional housing development changes that proportion of 275. So that may shrink unless you want to keep um, developing affordable housing at the same rate or uh, greater rate than housing altogether. If I could just interrupt for anyone that's not familiar with that, you made a reference to the state um, threshold of 10 percent that mm -hmm. what that does, it basically um, makes the town in control of new, larger, dense projects that they have to come for our approval. If we fall below 10 percent legally, uh, and I, it has happened in the past that uh, we have to accept uh, denser projects than our zoning would otherwise accept. Right. You're referring to 40B? Yeah. yeah. And 48A and 40B. Yeah. 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 So uh, a lot of a lot of conversation, a lot of confusion with the relationship of 40B to 40R. Um, 40B. Uh, sets that 10% threshold for affordable units uh, set at 80% of what the area median income is determined to be. Uh, 40R has similar but not exact uh, requirements for affordability. Uh, we'll get to that. Um, uh, yeah. Any idea how many of those 2,300 units are rental units? Um, I don't have that total in front of me. Uh, um, I think I have rental numbers uh, in a future slide, but bear with me, Mike. Um, uh, 
just going back to that. Uh, See, Kyle, fact. I, also, I want to add one more thing about about these numbers, which is uh, my understanding is that these affordability inventories, mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that we have 275 affordable units in Hadley. And right. we, we should really understand that. In fact, I believe it's twenty per, only 20% of that number um, needs to actually be affordable. So 20% of any development is affordable. The town can then list all of the units in that development. Right. So it's really closer to 2%. Or... Um, that's one fifth of this, maybe about 50 or 60 affordable units in the whole town. So it's it's considerably less when we're looking at this, you know, conceptually. Right, right. Thank you, Deborah. That's a good point. So Greenleaves is only 20% affordable? Well, that's what's allowed. I don't know what the actual is. Yeah. It's it's not a lot of developers will go above the twenty percent because it's right. for them it's, it's about the bottom line, right? Well, it changes the economics completely, right? Um, just speaking to the fact of most housing in Hadley is single family detached. It's about eighty percent current. Um, getting to this issue of affordability and the reality of the burden that housing costs um, is for many. Uh, so a, a household is considered burdened by housing if they spend 30% of their income on housing costs. So for renters, that's just rent utilities. Uh, for property owners, it's mortgage, utilities, property taxes, um, and other needs. 50% uh, or more um, would be considered uh, severely cost burden. I don't have those numbers, but 39% of renters in Hadley are burdened by housing costs, and it's 31% of homeowners. Um, and just for reference, um, as of August 2022, median sale price for a single family home in town was $434,525. You know, for, for what it's worth, um, if you compare the census data to the median home prices, assuming 30% debt to income ratio, six, something like 65% of Hadley residents couldn't afford to be first time home buyers in Hadley. Six, okay. Yeah. So, so a change from one out of three being burdened to two out of three not even. Being if, you, if you just look at the, the sale value compared to the income and you right. have a 30% ratio. Yeah. Assuming you know you don't have a house to sell as right. an asset, like to be a first-time home buyer and have those six percent of current Hadley residents somewhere in that range couldn't afford to be a first -time home buyer. Okay. Yeah. So um, uh, I think just the more we're this is general speaking for the steering committee, the more we're able to bring these data points together, the better we can kind of build a case for that that um, a variety of housing has a, a, an opportunity to, to support residents that currently live in town or would love to join the community. So uh, let's get to this question. What is smart growth? Um, we've been kind of dancing around it. Um, uh, a jargon definition from the American Planning Association uh, is that it, smart growth is an approach, right? Um, it provides choice in housing, transportation, and jobs, and amenities. Um, and it's done through comprehensive planning, trying to guide and design, develop, and build in these inclusive communities. So it's not a single tool or a single strategy or policy, more of a collection um, that tries to balance particular goals and strategies. Um, and ultimately, the goal is to preserve what it is that defines Hadley um, and ensures sustainable use of your current and your future resources. Um, so whatever smart growth means for Hadley, ideally, it, 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 would, um, it would be very familiar to residents. You know, it would, it would fit. And that's why 
as we look at examples, there can you may find similarities um, in terms of what it looks like, um, but it results in really distinct communities, oftentimes with a vibrant downtown um, zone or uh, district. Uh, common characteristics, um, smart growth zoning, or smart growth allows for you know, pedestrian friendly transportation, uh, off, oftentimes multiple transit options, including public transit or um, mixed use paths, uh, the like. It does mean higher densi density, uh, but that also includes mixing uses. So oftentimes you'll see, as in some of these downtown examples, um, commercial on the ground floor and one or two levels of uh, residential above, uh, which really before zoning was a common practice in America, that was what smaller communities and downtown quarters just what you did. Those communities you get there are probably some of the wealthiest in the States, very waspy and very white. Why don't you put like Ware up or Gardner or something like that, you know? Well, it may be that some I of mean, these- this is, this is not indicative of what we're, what reality is. Hmm. Thank you, Mike. You're, you're right. It's not, um, as I said, you know, smart growth tends to look um, similar in many ways, but it also leads to very distinct communities. Uh, you're right, though, that the, these examples are more affluent communities. So um, they're, they're towns that really needed affordable housing, but even but even we don't see ourselves in that class. But we still, you know, people yeah. if people are afraid they can't downsize and stay in town. It's a real concern. And at this point, I'd like to invite you know there are I think. Uh, 60 smart growth, 40 R districts in the state. Um, I can, I'll provide the master list, um, but if there are communities that you think are worth looking at as um, kind of a, a, a fair comparison based on your understanding of their demographics, their, their economies, um, please let, it, let me know, I'm happy to, uh, share those examples with you all and the broader community so that we're comparing apples to apples and not. Well, as you know, Hadley's never going to have a vibrant downtown unless you, you know, count the uh, Dunkin' Donuts in the middle of the town. Yeah. It's just the way it is. <laughs> I never. Right. Well, it's, um, the project that was built in the last year or so in the center of Sunderland, was that using a 40R, or was that just a special? I think that was a permit. permit. I think that was a friendly 40B. Oh, friendly 40B. Yeah. Okay. I, it's not on my 40R list. Okay. That's the senior okay. housing one, right? Yeah. 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 I think that was a friendly 40B. Okay. So. I think it was on Plumtree Road, wasn't it? No. Oh, no. That was a different. On Main, Main, North Main Street. No, I was thinking oh. back, back behind the Blue Heron. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think the, the one you're talking about, Mike, I think is a student housing developer. I can't remember who it was. Well, it started out being Scott Nielsen and then turned into, I don't know who. Yeah, yeah I'm thinking of the big red barn that I thought it was, uh, was it exclusively senior housing or just? Yeah, I yeah. thought so, yeah. 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 Yes. <clears throat> Which is attractive because it doesn't overburden the school system. You know, it's, mm -hmm. yeah. and that's what a lot of people are looking to get out of their big cumbersome houses and right. stay in town where their community is. Yeah. How does that sec that section in Hadley along, along um, you know, railroad road, um, you know, with like the pottery shop and the bookstore and the, you know, the quarters and all of that, that seems like a very mixed use area. What kind of, is that, is that an overlay area or how does that work? It's all the village center overlay. So yeah. I believe that would all be in the village center. Yeah. yeah. That's where Amherst Copy and right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's commercial. Okay. Yeah. Which, orders. which is, you know, that's where zoning permits that type of um, mixing of uh, uses. You get um, August and, and clearly yeah. that's a, Street's clearly a street that could use some 
rehabilitation yeah. or tear down. There's some buildings there, those old brick buildings that were potato storage trading buildings, you know, 60 years ago. And some of them has asbestos in them and the cost of doing anything there is prohibitive. Mm, that's right. Yeah. Um, so smart growth and housing. Um, what this typically looks like um, is introducing what is often referred to as the missing middle. Um, so um, it's that um, more accessible and diverse options, including duplex or a fourplex, uh, or your courtyard buildings, cottages, uh, townhouse, townhouses, um, uh, stack triplexes, which um, I see a lot of in Westfield where I live. Um, uh, it's it's that um, diversity of housing that has not been developed, um, uh, especially in communities like Hadley, where single family is, is the preferred or the, the permitted use by right. Uh, but it does not include, you know, the, the mid-rise, the five-story plus large uh, apartment complexes. This, these are, you know, a little bit, a little bit smaller than that, um, but add up quite a bit. Uh, so some broad general benefits of smart growth uh, because of infill, you know, developing where you have vacant land surrounded by um, infrastructure or redeveloping to increase density. Um, it's really, it really leads to efficient utilization of land, right? And that's, again, getting to that idea that you're, you're developing more compact um, in certain areas so that you're efficient and you preserve those um, untouched zones of your community. Uh, the mixed use, um, includes not only quality housing, um, but that's a variety of type and price. Um, so that allows for folks to uh, downsize if they want. It allows for the new, uh, the first time homeowners to have a, an entry point that is, you know, within their budget. Um, it also integrates, you know, the shopping, schools, community facilities, and, and economic opportunity. Um, because of this mixing of residents and commercial, uh, a sense of place results, which creates kind of this distinctive character and community. And then thinking about the transportation part of it, um, which is not just car focused or auto focused, uh, but thinking about mass transit, bicycling and walking particularly, uh, you develop or smart growth develops at a human scale, it's pedestrian friendly. So now, Mass General Law 40R and smart growth, is this smart growth? That's the big question. Um, Mass General Law Chapter 40R, titled Smart Growth Zoning and Housing Production. Uh, the law aims to promote smart growth development patterns, stressing nine goals. So you have increased available housing, a range of opportunities, emphasizing land use, taking advantage of compact design, fostering distinctive and attractive communities, preserving open space, farmland, natural beauty, and critical environment, strengthening existing communities, uh, providing, excuse me, uh, providing variety of transportation, uh, making development decisions predictable, fair, and cost-effective, and encouraging community and stakeholder collaboration in these development decisions. So that's how the Commonwealth kind of frames smart growth within the, the, um, the law. So I've got some examples here. Um, this is an older map. I don't have a new map, I apologize, but uh, 40R was first established in 2004, encouraging municipal, municipalities to zone for dense or smart growth. Uh, upon adopting a 40R and going through 
an application process. Uh, communities are actually paid by the state for the zoning and uh, permitting compact, affordable, mixed-use development. And as of March 27, 2024, there are 60 districts that have been approved. Um, that approval comes from the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. Um, that's who the application process goes through at the state level. Um, those districts are across 49 municipalities. So um, in our region, we have seven communities who have gone through this process prior. Um, uh, to mixed degrees of success, uh, and I haven't spoken to all the planners or communities involved, but I, I've got a good sense of what some have done and what some have not done. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that the most productive uh, of these has been Northampton, uh, particularly their Village Hill, uh, what formerly was Hospital Hill. Mm -hmm. So that was their 40R district from uh, first adopted in 2008. Um, they're now, um, they have developed 211 units there, um, and 151 of those, uh, are capital A affordable. Um, there is also plenty of market rate within that development. Um, some of those units going for, um, uh, greater than the median sale price in Hadley. So, uh, some pretty expensive properties right next to uh, brand new, uh, energy efficient, green mm -hmm. apartment buildings and co-housing and the like. So, uh, it is Jonathan Wright started that whole thing, didn't he? I think so. Yeah. I know, um, the mass development was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, the community builders, a nonprofit group has done a lot of the affordable housing development there. Um, I'm curious to know what, how, what the state pays Okay. For if we adopt 40R. It's an upfront payment. It's not a continuing, right? It's, not it's a little bit of both. Oh, is it? I'll get there. Yeah. If we were if you're ready to go on. Can I uh, just before we skip through sure. the slide? Yeah. Um so Northampton has used this successfully, but uh, um there's been uh, a couple or at least one that were treated more like spot zoning. Mm. And judging by these numbers, yeah, you know, Chicopee, one district, 41 units. Uh, I'd be curious because I've, I've heard a yeah. rumor that the state is cracking down and saying, you know, we need more expansive developments in order to approve the application, first right. and foremost. And they cited Northampton as a reason for that because they were being used for project by projects. Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to know, you know, in these districts that have been adopted, right. what is the, the highest capacity of housing units that new district can provide mm -hmm. compared to how many have been built? Right. Because a, a 41 unit district is not significantly impactful unless it's a district that can accommodate 300 units. So right. I'd be curious to see how that breaks down in the scale of these developments. Yeah, uh, I can get more detailed. Um, I I have from the, the Executive Office of Housing Level Bill Communities, um, we got this data directly from them last month. Uh, I had a wonderful conversation with two of their principal planners on this, um, on 40R specifically. Um, Looking at the Chicopee example specifically, um, they uh, their zone uh, anticipates a lot, uh, and they just haven't developed it. Um, so they got the maximum upfront incentive payment, mm -hmm. um, and uh, not much is really much. Uh, Northampton has done a lot of going back and forth with the state to expand their district um, because it, it has to be delineated like any zoning overlay. Um, uh, and they, they're trying to discourage that because it's just you know repeated work for the department. Um, but they've at least kind of built out that initial uh, district. Uh, Westfield is a curious case. I haven't spoken with anybody, but there's been no movement in that regard um, or in that district, and it was it wasn't a big one to begin with. So, um, is there a penalty for not following through? Uh, there's no penalty 
um, after the initial incentive uh, for adopting a 40R smart growth overlay, there's no penalty if you don't bring those online. You don't get the incentive of the payment per building permit. Mm -hmm. That is the encouragement to actually go through with the process. You get an upfront payment. Uh, and then for every unit that is brought online through the building permit, um, you get an additional payment. So the zoning in Northampton, I, uh, I'm a land surveyor. Okay. So I deal with this stuff all the time. And is the fact that they're allowing smaller lot sizes as let's call it infill, mm -hmm. is that necessarily part of 40R or can they just do that with their zoning bylaw and say, we're going to allow mm -hmm. these smaller lots to get more density? Right. Um, there are density requirements for the 40R district. So <clears throat> as long as those values match up with what the Commonwealth has set, and that's it is determined by the type of house. So, um, you know, density requirement for single family homes is, is less than the density requirement for multifamily. Um, so it would have to align with that at least, right? And yeah, there's some interesting stuff on Day Avenue and Sherman that's gone up in the last few years. Yeah. So it's these, un these units built or to be built, are they supposed to be purchased units or can they be rentals? Uh, they can be either. So, yeah. you know, look, looking at Ludlow, the 170 units, are those all purchased? How many of those are purchases and how many are rentals? Yeah, a lot of that, uh, a lot of Ludlow. So that's at the Ludlow Mills property, if you're familiar with that large uh, complex. Uh, yeah. Developer. Yeah. Uh, West Mass is part uh, of it. They were part of it, but it's, um, yeah. I don't know who's uh, Larry Curtis, uh, wind development. Wind, yeah. 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 Um, so I think, uh, I don't know about, there's two large buildings that are online at this point, um, that add up to 170. Uh, I don't know the breakdown of rental to, um, you know, market rate ownership to affordable ownership. Um, but yeah, it doesn't have to be strictly one or the other. Because yeah, um, one of the problems with try, trying to say, well, nobody can afford houses, is that they don't qualify for a mortgage, no matter what the price is. If you're renting, well, you can afford. Maybe you can afford to pay the lease, but you know you got to come up with a five or ten or twenty percent down payment, and you got a credit score of five fifty. Banks aren't going to lend, no matter what. Right. So that's just an observation. Thanks, Mike. It's it's a tough market out there for, for a lot of folks. Mm -hmm. um, so when we think about 40R, there are several components. Um, I will you know, push through these. I don't want to keep everybody too late. Um, zoning is um, part of this, right? This is smart growth zoning. Um, in essence, how 40R works is the smart growth district is defined as an overlay. Uh, so that's important to note, just keeping in mind that a developer can look at a property in a 40 R overlay in a smart growth district uh, and decide they don't want to build or develop to those uh, uh, restrictions. They want to go back to the underlying zoning and, um, and follow that. So just something to think about uh, as we consider this con this path forward it may be something that residents are more open to there are seven overlay districts currently in town so it's not a foreign concept necessarily um, and as we look at potential um, areas of town that you know, smart growth would uh, seem to fit um, it's also something to think about it might be worthwhile to keep an underlying zoning option. Um, so just want to make sure we pointed that out. Could I, uh, sorry to keep derailing this, but I just ask a critical question about that. Um, so if the underlying, if the underlying or under, underlying, underlying zoning okay. um, was say industrial mm -hmm. and we put a smart growth overlay district, which allows several other uses, different you know, parameters, that 
underlying zoning district is still in effect, which means in theory, you could have a smart zoned, um, you know, de higher density housing, mixed use housing development, and then immediate, immediately adjacent and industrial property. Yeah. And by right in that zoning, nothing is disallowed unless we amend the underlying zoning in addition to the overlay of the district. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, I'm thinking that the industrial wouldn't allow housing. So if you did build housing there, it would have to meet the 40 yard prescriptive. Absolutely. Right. I, I think that what I'm pointing out is just that the underlying zoning is going to be a critical part of the evaluation process That's for true. that reason. So we don't promote a smart growth in an industrial district, which could then result in adjacent uses that are either you know, hazardous to health or right. you know, human comfort. Yeah, no, that's a great one. Um, oh, so I've mentioned several times that we got to go up. And if we oh. get a new ladder truck, we can go up. Good point, good point. Three, yeah. four stories. That's another option, yeah. Another option yeah. to think about. I agree with that. Um, so when we start to get into the specifics of capital A affordable um, requirements of uh, 40R requires 20% of the total housing units developed to meet the 80% or less area moving. <clears throat> so that means for Hadley, uh, a household of one person making $61,000 a year would meet that 80% threshold and would qualify. Uh, that could um, translate to a rent approximately, uh, you know, anticipating 30% costs, um, $1,534 a month, which I haven't looked at rentals, rents, average rents. That seems pretty standard for a one bedroom. It's probably it's, in the ballpark. It's been climbing, but yeah. It's, it's around there, maybe, maybe badly climbing. So I say that'd be a, that'd be a sweet deal. Honestly. Yeah. All right. I, I, yeah. I thought, yeah. Say it's disgustingly accurate. Right. <laughs> uh, so just keeping that in mind, um, you know, uh, again, this is um, this is 20% of total housing units, right? So um, it's not that uh, all units need to be affordable at this rate, but uh, at least 20% of the total. Uh, as I mentioned, design standards are a uh, component of 40R. So that means just like uh, the existing zoning has done in the village center, talking about uh, the facade, you know, roof lines, uh, setbacks, and um, orientation of buildings in the village center of Hadley, 40R, Smart Growth District, would um, set standards for building facades, uh, streets and sidewalks, uh, entrances to those buildings or garages, off-street parking, um, open space, uh, landscaping standards, signage, and the like. Uh, also buffering to adjacent properties. So that might be something to keep in mind as we consider the underlying zoning. What does the um, what does the design standard allow for? And maybe that's how you can balance that if the so choose. Yeah, no, I understand <clears throat> the design standards are part of 40R, but um, zoning can be designed however we want. Mm -hmm. What design standards does 40R require be addressed by the overlay district? Um, I will have to get back to you. I don't, nothing's coming to mind where it's like strict. Right. I mean, I, yeah, I see so, the list says maybe yeah. addressed by the design standards. And uh, I just, I'm, I guess, yeah, let's, let's figure that out as we get into this further. Cause I think knowing what levers we can pull right. you know, from a design standards perspective, especially talking about the village overlay district, it'll help us to understand what we should and shouldn't require of those requirements. Right. And are they, a mix of predominantly do's or don'ts. You know, sometimes don't do this. Um, yeah. So uh, quickly, the incentives for 40R, uh, somebody asked those. Um, so three rounds of payments or, or incentives are offered. 
you have your initial incentive between 10,000 and 600,000. Those values haven't changed since $2,004. So um, depending on how many units you develop in that yellow uh, table, um, that determines what that initial payment is. Um, once you have the zoning in effect, you've received your payment, you start to develop in your smart growth district, an additional $3,000 is uh, granted to the community uh, for each building permit for a housing unit that is approved. So as you start to develop, you get those $3,000 payments per unit. Um, that's where, you know, a very large district that uh, would allow for more than 500 units would, you know, when you start adding up, um, it, it could get pretty big. Um, Are there uh, limits to how that money's spent? Like 3K, if we did 500 units, that's $1.5 million. Is that strictly for infrastructure services or can it be used at the town's discretion? To my understanding, it is um, check, and there's no restrictions. Now I know why Chickabee went for 501. Yeah, that's their their district allows for a lot. They went, they maxed out for that initial incentive, and they haven't brought a lot of units online. Um, just a yeah, yeah. So. Fair question. Uh, that last bullet where the state assists with education costs for school-aged children who move into a 40-yard development, that is a very underutilized program. Uh, my conversation with EOHLC, there's only been two communities that have continually applied for that. Uh, essentially, the town has to submit uh, numbers for school-aged children that live in the district to get that offset or that, that incentive amount. Uh, and to my knowledge, it tend, they haven't been paid in full consistently. Uh, it's not a kind of permanently funded program. What's uh, the rationale behind that? Just another inspiration to build the 40R? Uh, I think part of the, in, part of the rationale is <clears throat> encouraging like three, four bedroom units to actually be developed uh, in the district, encouraging young families to have affordable units, um, and then recognizing that with school buildings, you know, you can't you can't build more than what you have mm -hmm. kind of existing. So there there is some logic there, I think. But um, as I said, it's I think there's only been two that have annually applied, and they haven't gotten the full amount that the the formula would suggest they deserve. Well, before you get the money, do you have to prove that you have a developer that's interested in pursuing these projects? Not for that first bullet, not for that initial uh, incentive payment. As I said, Westfield has <laughs> developed nothing and there's, and they received, I believe, a $200,000 incentive payment. Yeah, it sounds, Mike, like we if we were to do this, we'd create a district and, and we would come up with a number of units that we feel like is buildable in that district, and then we'd get paid accordingly. Yeah, but even if nobody wants to build those units, i.e. a private developer, we still That's get paid. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. Call the deal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but also, just taking, taking note of, you know, um, Unless you go really big, the, that that initial incentive doesn't go very far. Right. No. Right. You know, yeah. I know. I know. In uh, Northampton, um, part of their uh, Village Hill development, uh, I believe Northampton leveraged less than a half million for like a forty million dollar development. So you know you can you can use the money well. You can leverage it uh, in a smart way, yeah. but um, you kind of need to have some development in in the works to yeah. really leverage it effectively. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm trying to wrap up here. Some requirements for 40 r we talked about the 20% housing that must be affordable. There are minimum densities 
right? So minimum density. Uh, for single family, you're squeezing eight units on an acre. Um, it's not unheard of, but that's pretty tight. Yeah. That's, that's you know, your tightest, most dense neighborhoods in Springfield in these, you know, older <laughs> urban centers. 5,000 square feet a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty tight for a single family home. Uh, 12 for the two or three family uh, units, um, 12 per acre. Uh, and then for a multifamily, more than three, um, you're looking at 20 units per acre as a minimum density. Does uh, rent versus ownership factor into how those are determined? Or is this like, you know, like all structures, single family detached, does single family detached, whether it's rented or owned? Yeah, to my understanding, they're all treated the same, regardless of ownership. Um, within a 40R district, there cannot, cannot be any age requirements. Um, and then the 40R district itself needs to be in what is called an eligible location. Eligible location. So we're going to get into this. This is our last kind of exploration. Um, eligible location could be three things. Uh, Transit-oriented development. Um, Hadley would not qualify, even with all the bus stops throughout uh, the community. There's not a transit hub, so that wouldn't qualify, or there's nowhere in the town that would qualify for that. Um, area of concentrated development, where at least 50% of the land is currently developed and currently zoned, either commercial or mixed use. That creates an eligible location. And then this very vague, other highly suitable location. Um, that's really those spots that don't meet the top two, but could be quickly developed. Mm -hmm. um, but when we think about an area of concentrated development, um, that's likely what um, any area in Hadley would qualify for. So if we play with a, a concept, an idea, this is not in stone by any means, but uh, a recent example of uh, eligible location, the planning board reviewed a conceptual map uh, that uh, planners from EOHLC quickly mocked up. This is an eligible location that could meet the requirements if the town wanted it. It is vast. It is two-tone because it is primarily centered around, I believe, is it the Econo Lodge? Mm -hmm. um, the mm -hmm. former hotel? Mm -hmm. um, this is a sample. This is an approximation. This is a concept. Um, speaking to what I believe Justin had mentioned, um, many of the early adopters of 40R really treated this as like a spot zoning strategy where they looked at a single very large parcel. Um, the, uh, the state is wanting to discourage that. Um, so they're looking at larger districts now more often. Um, and again, looking at, you know, the rate of existing development and how the existing zone relates. Um, in this concept that was offered, you know, you have a very large district in red. Um, the brighter yellow um, is kind of the minimum area that the EOHLC would look for. Um, that additional lighter yellow with the question mark that would be if the town wanted to go big and really get that incentive payment uh, maxed out, uh, you could consider creating more of a corridor, right? Going a little bit more linear along the roadway, uh, creating a larger area. But again, this is just a concept. Uh, this is over on the east side of town where there is no uh, there's a little bit of over. There's a little bit of overlapping with some existing overlay districts here, but primarily this is along the business industrial zone um, delineation uh, with Route Nine right in the center, uh, and that's primarily been the consideration of the planning board. To my understanding, is that this is really Route Nine up and down is kind of the the starting point of considering 
this path to smart growth? Yeah, it's got um, all the appropriate infrastructure. Right. Um, that's getting um, ongoing upgrades. Seems like yeah. forever. <laughs> Seems like since I've lived in Massachusetts. We're getting there. But you're getting there. You're making progress. Uh, so one last slide before any final questions. If 40R is the route that Keeney wants to go, it doesn't really change our timeline all that much. Uh, the public engagement events that we've scheduled or we're anticipating meets the requirements. Uh, I've already had an informal conversation with EOHLC, so they know that DLTA monies are being provided for this community to explore this idea. Um, you know, they helped make this concept last year, so they know that the planning board has been discussing it for a while. Um, if 40R were to be um, the path that the community wants to go, um, we would start working through an application process. Um, it would include a lot of the things that we're already going to generate, including a, like a locus map and an analysis of the impact. Uh, okay the design standards and, and the sort, all that's part of the application process. Uh, but there does have to be a local public notice and public hearing just for this topic if 40R is the path that the community wants to go. So we'd have to schedule a special public hearing just for this topic. Um, hopefully by the time we got a really close to final uh, bylaw language. Uh, and then in the fall, early winter, um, we would be sending all that information, an application packet to the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities. They have 90 days to get back to you. If you send uh, an application, uh, that gets a letter of eligibility. Um, and then you just have to show that it gets approved by planning board, select board, and then adopted at town meeting. Once that final adoption takes place, um, the letter of approval can get sent back and forth, and then the check follows that. Okay, and, and just so I'm clear of this money thing. Okay. Yeah. You get an, an initial payment when you approve the, the 40 yard district. Okay, yeah. And then, so let's say we, say we, we have hundred units. Mm -hmm. They're going to give us $75,000. Yeah. And then when we build unit one or somebody builds unit one, we get $3,000 yeah. for every unit up to the hundred. Right. Okay. In, in multifamily, it's per unit, right? Not per property. So there's a hundred units on a building permit. It's $300,000. That's a great question to clarify. I'm pretty sure it's per unit, I think, but I've read it also and it may be I've translated per permit, <laughs> so I will verify yeah. that, but I'm pretty certain it's per unit. Yeah. That's what it says behind you, so hopefully you yeah. got it correct. Right. I've looked at a lot of yeah, I documents about this, and they've changed yeah. a lot in the last yeah. 20 years. Yeah, I'm uh, sure. Unfortunately, those numbers, those monetary values haven't, um, but... Um, well, that yeah. seems to make sense. Uh, so, again, if... 40R is the path that the town wants to go. Uh, not a huge uh, change to our timeline, just makes it a little bit of work yeah. on the front end, or these summer months. <clears throat> um, and since I've gone way over time, I'll take any quick questions and then hand it back over to Mark. Uh, any questions from online, Deb, Mike, or... Uh, no, no what, if, can we get a link to this um, slideshow by any chance? You're gonna to have to drop by the senior center for a printed version. No, I'll I'll send it out, Deborah. I'm teasing. Okay, thank you. Andrew, any questions or no, I have no questions. Okay. Uh, questions, Your Honor. Uh, I know I've asked a lot, but uh just so that we can understand uh what the outcome might be if uh 40 hours zoning district were adopted and we had one in place. Um, you know, we don't have a design review board or like a you know formal project approval process beyond the planning board and the zoning board of appeals. Um, if we put in a 40-hour district, 
development in that 40R complying with the 40R zoning overlay requirements would be by right, which would mean we would have to approve unless we had some other mechanism. So is there value in adding to this conversation the process of approving projects in a 40R district so that if we do need a design review board, for example, mm -hmm. to help guide development, so it's not just, you know, mm -hmm. build whatever you want as long as it meets the check boxes? Um, I would think that since if, if 40R were the path that you go down, you create a, uh, a full uh, overlay district bylaw, right? So similar to uh, similar to the village center, you, know, you can add a full section on design standard. I would think just like each section of the zoning bylaw, you could add a procedure subsection. Mm -hmm. You could talk about professional review, anything like that. Um, I haven't looked at many of the bylaws that communities have drafted around it, just the kind of the model, um, but we can we can look at, see if there are good examples of opportunities and we can tackle that. Yeah, I, I bring that up only as a caution because you know we're a small community, but yeah. I've seen communities around the country grapple with large scale <laughs> developments in overlay districts like this, and mm -hmm. it's, it's overwhelming. You know, when you're trying to do a project review for 750 unit development, right. um, it can take, it's taxing, it can take a lot of resources and time. No, I so, understand that. It might be something where you have the peer. You know, the, yeah, there's got to be a way to, to have checks and balances there because otherwise we could end up with some really nasty, bad stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I agree that if we get to that point, there's got to be a way to make sure that whatever is being proposed is legitimate. Mm -hmm. And an obvious question I see is our zoning as an underlying district, would that, you know, we have onerous, we have very restrictive parking requirements. Mm -hmm. Would that be negated? Would the state make that, we'd have to amend that to, to meet there? Or would that be in, in our control? I mean, that's... So parking would be part of the design standards that you would um, so yeah, you would think about, you know, what makes sense in a more, um, compact or dense development, mm -hmm. uh, and just keeping in mind that unless some type of buffering is considered, uh, within those design standards, you could end up with very tight, um, traffic lanes, mm -hmm. limited parking right next to kind of the base, um, uh, parking requirement. Yeah. And is it true that whatever the 40 yard district doesn't address is a is just sort of carried into the underlying zoning. So if, for example, a 40 yard didn't have parking requirements, the underlying zoning would have to dictate. So we, whatever we want to control has to be part of the 40 yard language. Yeah. Okay. That's my understanding. Okay. Well, thank you. You, um, you missed your target, but hopefully yeah, sorry. that was just us un un right. un underestimating. I'll take the blame. <laughs> we can all take no, that's mine. No problem. I do have some business we need to. Uh, we should have like a organizational. Um, Jim Matt when he said, let's create this, he asked me if I would mind sharing it. Uh, if that's okay with, uh, I you know, want everyone to be on board with me being the chair of this and uh i would entertain a motion and also um it seems like kayla um is the clerk would be the clerk yeah um i don't know that we need anything i don't think we need a treasure i don't see any funds coming no. on our way no so. so i'll make a motion to approve mark dunn as chairman and kayla as the clerk of this committee i'll second okay any discussion? Any concerns? Questions? Hearing none. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Wait, do we need to do a roll call? Andrew, yeah, I think we have to. That's why I was asking. Andrew, you said. Aye. Yeah, I approve. I approve. Okay. Thank you. And Mike, you said aye. Aye. And Deb? Aye. And who am I forgetting? Call out the names of us in here. Yeah, so, okay. so you're not. Right. So we, we have six of us tonight. 
so Mark says I, Mike says I, Randy said I, um, Just, Justin, Deborah, and uh, and Andrew. So yep. So it's unanimous. Okay. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to discuss was um, meeting time and venue. Um, I was leaning towards, unless there were any feelings otherwise, having hybrid um, so that we would always have Zoom um, to get the maximum attendance, uh, but continuing to offer an in-person um, for those for whom it becomes convenient. Yeah. And then time and day, you know, um, Monday seems like a night that's not booked by a lot of other organizations. Yeah, but it right. might be a you know a sacred night for some people. So I don't know if that's a problem. That's sacred. It's kind of sacred for me. But uh, how how often are we going to meet? Once a month. Yeah, I would say monthly, and there could be a couple of times we might squeeze a yeah. early okay. late. Yeah. There's no way we could piggyback on the uh, planning board meeting on Tuesday night. Huh? That, that could be five that could be late, Mike. Yeah. yeah. Before yeah. at 5 o'clock. And then we're limited to, well, an hour and a half. Yeah. And it doesn't, I don't care. It doesn't It doesn't matter to me one way or the other. Um, I just don't know how you and Mark are going to feel being at meetings for potentially four hours. <laughs> yeah, that is true. There is a, a human need for stretching and sustenance. And, yeah. yeah. Okay, keep it here then. Okay, 6.30? Or 5. Or 6.00, whatever. Or, yeah. or, or 5.30 to 6.30 and then yeah. I can... Before or after dinner, what's does 5 anyone 30, have? Five thirty, five thirty to six thirty would be great yeah. on Monday. That works for me. I can do that. I can do that. Um, um, is it easier to do five? <coughs> or do people go? Uh, again, I don't care. Okay, whatever. I mean, if it's five, then I can just come right from work. Yeah. So that works. Even okay. If, okay. So that way we do five. All right, Mike. Perfect. So we say five to six, and sometimes if we think it's going to be a long meeting, we might make it five to six thirty. That's fine. Like well, this, we, yeah, whatever. I mean, start at five and we end when we end. Yeah, this turned into an hour and a half. So. Yeah. yeah. All but right. So we had a lot. I. Can we can we have a heads up on the dates um, ahead of time? You know, ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we could draft up a. a why don't I uh, task Kyle with drafting up? Um, he and I can work on a draft schedule, and we can send that out to everyone okay. and see if there's any dates that are problematic. With you know, obviously we're going to have some vacations and other conflicts. So, Kyle, based on what you said about our time frame and the money that we're qualified for till the end of the year, mm -hmm. meeting once a month is that going to be enough? Yeah, I'm looking at this now, and I'm um, thinking maybe public engagement session is next month. So average one and a half. Yeah. So you might have some months with two, and maybe a two, and then a one, and a two, and a one. You know. Yeah. Might be what we end up. Yeah, and that's do. that's fine. I mean, if we're going to do this, we got to do it right. If, if sure. at the end of the year that funding runs out, will it? Will there be a new round of funding for the following year that uh, we might qualify for? Possibly. Uh, I think. It's the the final goal of the, this project, this funding source, is to have some model language, some draft language in front of the planning board. Yeah. So the had the planning board for many years now has contracted with PBPC. Yeah. To offer professional consultation. Yeah. If we got to January first, the planning board had draft language, but they had some tweaking to do that might be able to get accomplished through regular planning board yeah. assistance, or we can look at additional funding sources. Okay, so my opinion is we need to get the public involved in this relatively quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what 
everybody's opinion is as to the the uh, need or desire. I mean, does the state mandate we have to do this, or is this uh, is this an option? So the state requires two public engagement. No, I mean forty R. Oh no. <laughs> So 40R is a completely optional right. program. Okay. We um, could modify and, our existing zoning as we want. Yes. And even the project itself does not say that 40R is the final product. Yeah. It's okay. just saying that That's the planning board wanted us to make sure that sure. we okay. it. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. I think, I think we should probably schedule bi-weekly and then cancel if we don't need one mm. rather than the alternative where people are going to get booked through the summer with trips mm. and vacations and stuff. Yeah. yeah. As soon as we can get the public, you know, we get to a place, a place where we can make some sense of having a public meeting, uh, a hearing or, or whatever you want to call it. Right. Um, then we should do that so we can get a feel for what the, what the, flavor of the town is relative to this and I, I know we're going to get all of 20 people to come but yeah. round up the usual suspects right <laughs> um so we could schedule like every three weeks or we could schedule every two weeks and then cancel as we as we see fit that's probably better i, I think <laughs> i'd go with that <clears throat> i'd go with every two weeks and cancel if we can Justin, okay. Justin suggested that's okay. a good idea. Yeah, two weeks out is the Monday the 20th. Okay, I, I may not be here, but that's okay. Carry on. What will we need for corn? So are we doing every two weeks or are we doing we have twice twice a month? Four. Like like the, the planning board is the third, first and third. third. Yeah. You know, so we we could do two per month. Is that what we're yeah? Yeah. Yeah, let's let's do that. Sure. Yeah. Rather than every two weeks. So then yeah. first and third. Or we could do second and fourth. I, you know. Either one is fine. The fourth of this month is Memorial Day. Yeah, it's not that, but keeping that in mind. <coughs> Excuse me. I don't I don't have a problem with first and third. I don't either. Yeah. Okay. So okay. looks like today's the first. So yeah. <laughs> Okay. Okay. First and third. Well, there we go. We've drafted our schedule. Well, thank you, Kyle. You did a great job. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Caleb. Thank okay. you, anyone else watching. Time to go home and eat. Motion to adjourn. Motion. Second. Second. Roll All in favor? All vote. Aye. All vote. I will go through the roll call vote. Um, Andrew. Are you in favor of adjourning? Aye. Aye. Deborah. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Justin. Yes. Randy. Yes. Mike. Yes. 